So basically, about bullying here, all I've got to say about it in a nutshell is that it stinks, and I could probably just go and sit back down because that's all there is to say about it. But the problem is that I know it stinks, and you know it stinks, and everybody knows it stinks, and yet it's still happening, and we're still doing it. So there's a problem. And I think that part of the problem is a problem with the language. Because we tend to think of bullying as Mr. Muscle beating up on the little guy, or cool girl, uh, you know, picking on somebody who she considers to be a little less cool. And those are what I call these guys the big B bullies. Okay, but, but, the, but the reality about bullying, and so we think, oh, that, this is, um, you know, oh, those bullies, those other people, that's the problem. But the reality of bullying is that it's also everybody else. Everybody else. We can't afford to think about the problem of bullying as this nameless, faceless bully with a capital B, right? Somebody else. When the roots of oppression run deep in us all. So I'm not interested so much in treating the symptoms of bullying. I'm interested in the cure. It's the difference between picking a weed and uprooting it. And with the everybody else here, because what happens is, well, you know, you might be this guy here. Maybe from the experiences you've had in your life, they may kind of make you a little bit angry. And so in your relationships with other people, you treat them with, with, with anger, you know? Or, or maybe you just, nobody cares about you, so why should I care about anybody else? You know, this, the, 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 the apathetic, I, I don't care about you because nobody cares about me. And that translates into how you treat other people. Or maybe, you, you know, this little Mr. Resentment guy here, you know, you walk around with, you know, just whatever it is that you've, you're, you're holding on to from your life experiences and so you treat other people resentfully. Or maybe it's uh, this guy here. You don't trust people because your trust has been betrayed and so you're just that, maybe that, that little bit nastier to people and how you treat them. Or maybe you're just downright, ang you know, furious. Mr. Yelly, I call this guy. And, and well, you know, you might think, well, I've got the right to be like this because I've been treated like this so I'm going to go and treat other people like that and well I've got a right to be like that and I've got a right to be like that but the reality of it is that it's not you think it's just me and I've got that right but the reality is that it's everybody and then you just got everybody treating everybody at the very least unkindly and at the very worst cruelly and I think that unkindness is a form of cruelty I, the best, in my opinion, the best weapon and the best defense against anything is understanding. So that's my strategy, and that's what I'm here, that's what I'm hoping that we can accomplish here together today, going through this. So, bullying. Believe it or not, there is an equation to it. It's as much a mathematical equation as gravity. Okay? And this is as mathematical as it's going to get, so don't you worry. <coughs> But you need, there are certain ingredients that are needed in order for there to be bullying. And the first, obviously, is a bully. You can't have bullying without a bully. Um, second, the victim. You're not going to have bullying if there's nobody <laughs> to be victimized by it. And then, of course, there's the witness. And they're all equally important. Without any one of these, there cannot be bullying. And as we go through, I wonder if you'll you'll see that for yourself. And of course the witness is there. It could be anything. The witness could be all kinds of responses that people have to having seen or heard about bullying happening. Anything from, you know, finding it terribly hilarious to being kind of scared to getting some kind of perverse form of pleasure out of it. Worry, apathy, or, or just uh, uh, shock and worry, right? And all of these, it doesn't matter what what reaction? The, bu the bully feeds off of all of these. It, none of them actually changes the formula. Right? They all play into the phenomena of bullying. And, sorry, I'm just thirsty. Uno momento. I also want to point out that, you know, I am here with the hopes of helping victims of bullying. But I want to make it very, very clear here that I, it's not just this guy here that I consider to be a victim of bullying. 
It is everybody involved in the equation of bullying who is a victim of bullying, in my opinion. There was recently a CBC radio show about bullying where they had people call in. They had people who in the past had been bullies to other people and they called in and talked about their experiences and how it has impacted their life and damaged them as human beings and had repercussions throughout the course of their lives. And then they had people, victims of bullying, you know, calling in and talking about how that has destroyed their lives over the long term. <coughs> this kind of thing, it, it doesn't just go away right after it's done. It has long-term effects. And amazingly, they also had people calling in who had witnessed bullying at some point in their life and to this day, as adults, re have regret that they did nothing. They live with regret and they live with guilt and it has caused damage in their lives that lingers even years and years and years, decades later. Right? So everybody is affected by this for the worse. Uh, first we are going to look at the bully, uh, Mr. Muscle. And remember, it's not just the guy who beats up on other guys, or even the girl who beats up on other whoever, uh, but it's also the cool girl who, or whoever just picks on somebody else for being different. Um, but it's also everybody else and how we treat other people unkindly or cruelly or resentfully or angrily. So just I know we all know what the forms of bullying are, but just very quickly that it there's the physical bullying, which is the physical domination of somebody else. I'm going to beat you up, or I'm going to threaten to beat you up, or threaten to harm you, or actually harm you physically. And then there's the psychological bullying, with words instead of punches, and exploiting the fears of others, and exposing them, and harming people psychologically. So all, there are so many ways that people bully. And they all fall into either psychological harm or physical harm. And I, I really do think that we have all been, we've all played some role in this. I mean, you know, I've been, you know, I, I be, I've been this guy, right? I've been that guy. I don't think I've ever been this guy here. But, but, you know, one story, like, like for, for being this guy, I could tell you um, when I was in high school, and it's such a silly story. It's such a nothing. But it's, that's the point. They're, these aren't nothings. Um, but I lent my, I, was, I grew up in a private Christian school and um, one day I lent my Bible to, to a classmate and when she returned the Bible she had spilled liquid paper all over it, all over it and uh, she had also like, highlighted it and underlined and everything and I was just aghast, I was, I was just like I can't believe you did that to me and I was angry but I, I, the way that I treated her in my anger was more, I treated her more unkindly than I felt because she was on the nerdier side of things. And I, I, I treated her like that. I looked down at her. That she, of all people, had done that to me. Right? So my sense of superiority over her and her sense of inferiority to me, she accepted it. She allowed me to treat her like that. And a dash of anger birthed the bully in me. That's all it took. And, you know, and it was just three minutes. It was just like that. And then I went off, and then I cooled down and felt like crap, and I went back and I apologized right away because I felt so bad about it, and then everything was right again. But it was just, that's all it took to treat somebody that much more unkindly, and it was a superiority meets it, a sense of inferiority. There's nobody superior. Nobody's inferior to anybody. That's all crap. But it was the sense of my superiority, the sense of her inferiority, right? And what, what was it? What was the whole point of it? It was over a, a Bible. I treated the Bible with more respect than I treated another human being. And it was, it was a show. It was, it was a demonstration that I am better than you. That's what it became. That's what it was about. And that's what bullying is. Bullying is a show. It's an act. It's a demonstration of my superiority over you, my physical superiority over you, my psychological superiority over you. This raises the question, why do we show off? In case you can't tell, this is a peacock. This is a gorilla beating his chest. And then that's Mr. Muscle, the, the bully. In my opinion, first of all, as animals, 
And we are animals. I'm sorry if I'm the one who has to break that to you. We are very much animals. But as animals, I, I think that hierarchy must be built into our genes. Right? Survival of the fittest and the instinct to eliminate threat by establishing dominance. And in that sense, I think uh, that the bully is not unlike an alpha hyena, as I, I like to compare. You know, this, this, this sort of nasty, this laughing, uh, brute, uh, feeding on the, the carcasses of others, right? But as, as thinking beings, we generally consider ourselves to have evolved beyond the hyena and beyond the instinct to divide weak from strong. Why do we compete? Why do we show off? Why show off strength if not to say, please think I'm strong? Why try to act cool except to say, please think I'm cool? Why make you feel stupid except to say, please think I'm smart? And where does all of this come from? Fear. The fear that I'm not strong, the fear that I'm not cool, the fear that I'm not smart. If you think I'm strong, then I must be. If you think I'm cool, then I must be. If you think I'm smart, then I must be. All of these things come from the same place. Just fear and insecurity. Believe it or not, no, don't believe anything. If you see it for yourself, then it has done. Don't, but believe it or not. Fear is revealed in the act of bullying. The worst bully is the most afraid, with the lowest sense of self. Have you ever seen a dog attack somebody? You must have seen the fear there. A dog that attacks you is a dog that's afraid of you. The worst behavior comes from animals, including humans, who are afraid. Confidence and security do not behave that way. Strength, true strength, actual strength has no need to make a show of itself. So those who show off strength feel weak. And by bullying, prove it. Violence, whether physical or psychological, is an act of powerlessness. It reveals that I can think of no better way to get what I want. It is the crudest form of action, and ultimately, the weakest form of influence. I'm just going to take a look here at power, very briefly. I don't know, I, I hope you can tell who this is. This guy here, obviously, Hitler, artistic render, all original artwork done by me. And I don't know if you recognize this little guy here, but this is Gandhi. Does everybody know who Gandhi was? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, if you don't know who Gandhi was, find out. This is very, it's, a, it's an incredible story, what he accomplished. And I'll tell you a little bit more about him. But first, we all know, does everybody know who Hitler was? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Does anybody not know who Hitler was? Okay. So you guys are just shy to say anything at all. All right. So Hitler here. This guy brought millions of people to war through violence. He controlled millions of people through fear. Now Gandhi brought millions of people to peace by fasting, not eating. And he had the hearts of every one. So the, he, this guy here, who wanted all the control in the world, in reality had none. What do you think would happen if it was one day inconvenient for them, for any one of these millions of people, to not follow him? Do you think that they would have been faithful to him? He had the trust of no one. Gandhi, who wanted no control in the world, had total control because they loved him. That was the only source of the power and the influence that he had. So power through fear versus power through love, there is no comparison. So those who choose fear as the source of their power are those who feel most powerless 
to accomplish it any other way. So bullies are the weakest among us. But we all have that weakness, every single one of us. But with the big B bully, it's an addiction. Right? And it's never enough. I like to compare bullying to a drug. And I actually consider bullying to be a form of drug. It's addictive. So what happens is you have this, the, whatever feelings are going on, whatever pains, whatever insecurities, whatever sufferings you've experienced, and you're looking for a quick fix. And you find that beating up on somebody or treating somebody like that gives you that quick fix. You feel stronger, you feel cooler, you feel smarter, artificially, but it feels like the real thing. And then the next time it comes around, you want another fix, and then you want another fix, and then it becomes a habit, and there you have your bully, a person addicted to belittling others. And, as with a drug, the bully is completely unaware of how transparent that kind of behavior looks to everybody else. That guy is messed up. What's so sad and so tragic about this is that this is a problem of self-sabotage. Because in my experience, the bully usually is actually strong, actually smart, actually probably cool or whatever, not that that matters one bit. The whole problem of the bully is that the bully doesn't believe it. Right? Somewhere along the way, through whatever unfortunate circumstances, the bully has been made to feel afraid, or powerless, or stupid, or weak, or whatever insecurities plague us all. So if the bully had a healthy and accurate and unmeddled with sense of self-worth, there would be no problem. That's what's so silly and so tragic about it. I'd like to introduce you to one of my favorite authors, Mark Twain. Does anybody, do people know who Mark Twain was? Or are you just silent again? <laughs> he's great, he's funny, he's hilarious, I love him. This is his self-portrait. I like to include it there to point out that I'm a better artist than this guy. And he said, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. So, this is true of words and equally true of actions. I might feel weak and afraid and powerless or whatever, but unless I go around stomping on people, nobody would know it. So think about what your words and actions reveal about you. Don't be so quick to reveal your weakness and your insecurity and your fear. You don't demonstrate intelligence by going around and treating people like idiots. You don't, go, you don't demonstrate strength by using it to harm others. Right? And trying to act cool isn't cool. This is the logic of fear. These are the behaviors of fear. So bullies, if you're so strong, then prove it genuinely. Right? Picking on the weak proves nothing but weakness. What is strength for, if not to protect? As organisms, that's why it's there, that's its function. To protect me, my mate, my offspring, and anybody else I'm connected to. It's essential to survival. So, bullying is fundamentally a perversion. It uses strength for the opposite, unnatural purpose of harming myself and others. A bully is a malfunctioning organism. And as for bullies who psychologically devastate their victims, if you're so clever, then prove it. You're genuinely. Crippling the already frail just proves cruelty and stupidity. What is intelligence for, if not for problem solving? As organisms, that's why it's there. That's its function to identify problems, potential and real, and to identify solutions. So again, this form of bullying is a perversion. It uses intelligence for the opposite, unnatural purpose of creating problems where there would otherwise be none. So, if you're bullying, then stop it. You can do better than that. Back to our equation. We're now looking at the victim. And I want to point out again that the victim here is not just this little guy who's gotten beat up here. 
but it's also right. So physical victims of physical uh, harm, victims of psychological harm, and it's also the the bully who himself or herself has been victimized or who is victimized by their own behavior towards other people. Their their lives are harmed, and everybody else, one way or another, how we've been impacted hurt, damaged by other people, and how that hurt and damage translates and how to we, we treat other people. So everybody's a victim. But the big picture of victim of bullying, what makes a victim? What makes it possible for me to be abused in this way? And I want to make it very clear here that this is in no way to suggest that the victim is to blame for anything. The blame goes to the bully, or to whoever chooses to do violence. But with that said, as a necessary part of the equation, what makes a victim? I wonder if you can guess. It's fear. Bullying is domination, right? And domination is only possible through the manipulation of fear. I wonder if you can see that. If I am afraid of anything, anything, my fear can be manipulated. It can be used to control me. There may be physical fear, that she might punch me or beat me up, right? Or there could be the psychological fear, that she'll identify my weakness or my insecurity or something that I'm embarrassed about and expose it or exploit it. And since I fear you, I submit, I don't resist. So again, if I am afraid of anything, my fear can be manipulated and used to exploit me. And that is the bully's power. Without fear and without insecurity, there is nothing to exploit. The bully is powerless. Having insecurity around bullies is like Superman handing kryptonite to his enemies. And the enemies are not, they'd be foolish to attack Superman without it, right? Without fear, the bully is powerless. So, with animals, right? An animal doesn't attack somebody that it thinks it can't beat. That would just be stupid. And it's the same with a bully. Bullies are, their behavior is stupid, but bullies aren't stupid. So, for example, in this lineup here, like, who, uh, who, who would you think would be the victim? It, you know, it's, it's kind of obvious, right? Uh, you know, either like a, a hygiene thing or, a, you know, some people stand out height-wise or short-wise or, you know, zip-wise or whatever it happens to be. You think, oh, well, those, are, those ones are definitely going to be the, the, the targets of bullying, right? But in reality, here, it is everybody, everybody can be victimized by the bully. Because it's not any specific quality that the bully targets. It is only fear. I'll tell you a couple of stories to give you some examples of this. Again, stupid little stories or whatever, but, but I think that they relate a little bit. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many people here know this, but I, I used to be a girl. Right? I was born a girl. My name used to be Caitlin. I'm a transsexual. I transitioned. Um, so if you didn't know that, surprise. And, uh, <laughs> but it's kind of relevant to the story. If you don't know that, it's kind of difficult. Because as I used to have, well, there's a lot of things I used to have, but that I don't have anymore. But one of the things I used to have <laughs> was a big butt, right? A great big bubble butt. And that was like, of all the things, I felt like, I, I was mortified. I was so afraid of anybody pointing out the size of my butt, the girly butt, and I had to wear for my school uniform with private Christian school. I had to wear a skirt, and like thinking like a guy, I used to wear my gym shorts under my skirt because it just made you know things more efficient, <laughs> and with no thought to what it looks like to have a big bulky shorts under your skirt, which only made the problem worse. And sure enough, one day, grade six, I think, a bunch of kids came up and started teasing me about it. You know, like, hey, you've got a big butt, and uh, other witty remarks. And I was, I, was, I was mortified. I just, I wanted to crawl into a hole and die. But then I had this thought that if, if I don't show that I'm embarrassed about this, then they won't know that I'm embarrassed about this. They only know what I show them. 
it was just it was just this, this moment of clarity. And so, you know, I did have a big butt, so I was like, yeah, you know. And then I said something like, you know, but isn't it a good thing these days for a girl to have a big butt? And believe it or not, they were like, uh, actually, yeah, actually, people like big butts, so. And I laugh over that. And I, I never heard a word about it again. It's very interesting. So, it taught me a valuable lesson in the vulnerability of insecurity and the power of confidence. And then uh, there's another story. In kindergarten, speaking of having been a girl, ki in kindergarten was the first time that I first said to anybody that I, I felt like a, like a boy. You know, my best friend, James, standing in line, I'm like, I, I don't like being a girl, I wish I were a boy, I feel like a boy. Blah, blah. And then people overheard, and it got teased, and I vowed then and there, I will never speak a word about this again. Now, I broke that vow, you know, 20 years later, or whatever it happened to be. But because I was afraid, because I, I took that message, this is something to be ashamed of, this is something to not talk about, it had a long-term impact on my life. That one moment where everybody's instinctive reaction to what they didn't understand or whatever, this, oh, you're, you're gross, you're weird, whatever you are, right? And I took that to mean something about me, and it had then the power to control me and how my life would play out. So those two stories, I wonder if that helps to give a picture of how you respond to the situations you find yourself in and how genuinely, if there is no insecurity, then they could have that reaction and you can be untouched by it. That is the cure. Without insecurity, you cannot be big, be bullied. You can be beat up, you can be killed even, you can be teased, we all get our fair share and more. But without fear and without insecurity, you cannot be big, be bullied. So I'm, I'm going to add somebody here to the, to the lineup. I'm going to, Gandhi, let's go back to him, right? And he was this, this tiny little man, tiny little frail little man. And he was, he in India, if you don't know the story, he lived in India in the early 20th century, and he was treated, Indi India was owned by the British, uh, there was a colonial power, and the people, the native people of India were treated like so many other native people who have been colonized by another culture. They were treated like second class citizens, they were beat up, they were treated like untouchables. Right? And he said, and he experienced all of these things, he said, you can't hurt me without my permission. And when he said something, he meant it. So think about that. Unless I allow you to touch me, then you have no power over me. So, pardon my language, but screw fear. Right? Just screw it. Screw insecurity. So what if you're tall or short or or fat. So what if you're transsexual? So what if you're gay? So what if you're bisexual or asexual? So what if you're? Uh, so what if you have a big butt? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> Experiment with loving yourself. You will find it makes you immune. It is the cure, and it's the same cure for bullies. Right? Screw fear. Screw insecurity. Love yourself, love everybody else. Right. And that's where you'll find your unmeddled with sense of self-worth. And that's where you'll find the you that is not cruel. So, if you're being bullied, then take control. Take your control back. If, if, if you are being harmed, and, and this victim of bullying is not just somebody who's gotten beat up kind of thing. If you are being harmed in any way, physically, psychologically, sexually. If there is somebody who is harming you, then speak about it. Tell your parents, tell the teacher, tell the principal, tell the janitor, tell the police, tell the reporter, I don't care. Be a tattletale. There are worse things than continuing to be harmed. The idea that, there, that people experience these things and feel that they have no right to say or do anything about it is so disturbing to me.
to have a healthy sense of your self-worth means that you know exactly where the boundaries are about how another person can treat you. You are as powerless or as powerful as you think you are. If you think you're powerless, then you are. And by the same mechanism, if you think you're powerful, even if you aren't, you are. Believing makes it so. So screw fear, screw insecurity, love yourself, and live confidently. This Gandhi guy. The British occupied the country. They had all of the... At the time, I think, they, they, at some point, the, England owned like something like half of the world. This was an empire, the most powerful empire in the world. And Gandhi, who would never lift a finger to harm anybody, no violence. You do not, he was beaten up, he was treated like crap, and he would never respond to the violence of another with more violence. Which is foolish, it's unintelligent. And all he said was, no. This is our home. It's time for you to leave. Long story short, he won. That's it. The only power he had was truth and love. And the love of all of the people who, when they're being violent, when they're rebelling, when they're doing this, that only makes the soldiers go and beat up and fight back harder. He would say, you know what? I am not going to eat until all of the violence has stopped in this country of millions upon millions upon millions of people where there was no Facebook there was hardly even newspapers and anyways the majority of the country couldn't read and spread through word of mouth like wildfire why? because everyone in the country loved that man and when they heard that he is going to die if we don't stop our violence they stopped the violence millions upon millions of people that is power. And he won. After much ugliness. They did get beat up. They did get jailed. He was jailed I don't know how many times. He was treated horribly. But he won. As he said, first they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. Then you win. So experiment with that. And I think you will find that a strong sense of self is as good as a bulletproof vest when it comes to abuse. And now back to our equation. The last ingredient, the witness. The witnesses are not just the people who are standing around watching somebody get beat up, although, <laughs> come on, I don't understand the standing around while somebody gets beat up. But it is also Right? The, 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 the person being beat up, it may be that that is the only witness to the violence, to the bullying. If, if, the, if the victim lying on the ground is the only one that sees the power that the bully is exercising over them, that's enough for the bully. I can feed off of that, that's enough for me. The minute, if that's the only witness and they go unconscious, the bully's not going to continue, right? Because then there's no point. Without a witness, there is no point. Because the bully feeds on that sense of seeing themselves as more powerful through that person's eyes or through those people's eyes. That's why they do it. That's the fix. So, and it could be another bully. It can be everybody else. It could be somebody who hears about it afterwards. It could be somebody the bully brags to afterwards. But a bully that acts only in secret, in my mind, would just be insane. <laughs> Sadistic. You step away from a serial killer. Very disturbing. The bully needs a witness in order for any of this behavior to be worth it. Do you think that as a witness to bullying, that you're not involved? Do you think that laughing when somebody gets teased, is that innocent? Or standing by when somebody gets beat up, is that innocent? Bullying is a show. And as the witness, you are the one that the show is for. Whether it's to, to laugh, oh great, now I feel funny because they're laughing. Or whether it's fear, I feel powerful, they're afraid of me. Or perverse pleasure, we can enjoy this perverse pleasure together. You are involved. All of these reactions play into it. 
but you think, well, it's it, for me. It's okay. Like I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get involved, right? Because for whatever reason, I've got. I've got. You know, you know I'm just not. I just don't care. I'm just too busy with my own problems to worry about your problems, etc. And you think, well, there's all these reasons why people don't intervene in a case of bullying. But all of that is irrelevant because you know what? To the to the victim, this is what the witness looks like. All of them, nameless, faceless, people who just don't give a crap. What's ironic about this whole thing is that this whole, all of these witnesses are more powerful than the bully. More powerful. Because the bully wants something from you. Your fear, your laughter, your respect, your admiration, your submission. And when I want something from you, you are in a position of power. That's how it works. So exercise that power. You have the ability to refuse to give the bully what the bully wants. Refuse to give your laughter, your fear, your respect, your submission. And see how that can deflate the bully. So there are all of these reactions to bullying. And all of these reactions the bully feeds off on. He loves it. He likes it. The only reaction in my opinion, to bully, to the cruel treatment of another person, is the healthiest reaction, which is appalled. I am appalled. I don't know if you know what that word means. Appalled means going pale. The draining of the blood from the face is a shock reaction. I can't believe you're doing that. And being appalled, you react. You, you react. One example of I could get, one time when I was in high school, elementary school actually, um, there were these two guys who were fighting, beating each other up, punches. And I don't even know what the whole thing was about. And I was just, I was just appalled. And when I'm appalled, I'm, when I'm appalled, I butt in. So I, I go and I stand between them. What's going? What? Stop! And I got punched in the face, right? Like obviously. And it was a stupid thing to do, but it worked. It stopped right then and there. And of course, because I was a girl too, right? Then it became about a guy punching a girl, and then they got you know, even more trouble, right? But it, 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 even the dumbest idea like that is enough to put an end to cruel, senseless behavior. And by a weird twist of events, one of the guys who'd been fighting ended up with a crush on me. For years afterwards, even though I wasn't interested, I, um, I'm hetero, I, I have a wife. Um, and so I felt really bad for the guy. In years he had a crush on me. Not interested. Um, I'm just not it. No offense. You know, not that there's anything wrong with that. But I, I, I don't. I'm not attracted to guys. So I felt so bad for this guy. And it, it, it was, it was interesting that it, all of the things that the bully wants: respect, admiration, submission. The irony of it is that these things, in my own experience, I know that these things are not, they are gained by doing exactly the opposite of bullying. Exactly the opposite. It's the intolerance of violence that inspires respect, admiration, even submission, whether you want it or not. I didn't want it. So, that's one of the reasons that bullying bugs me so much. It is not just bad, it is stupid. It's the opposite of intelligent behavior. It's the means to the opposite of the end that the bully wants. Right? So if you're bullying, then stop it. So the, the reality about bullying is that 85% of bullying ends within 10 seconds of peer intervention. So the problem is not that we can't stop bullying, it's that we don't. Because the majority of witnesses to bullying don't intervene. And I wonder if you can guess why. Fear. Fear and fear and fear. It's an infection, it's an epidemic. So let's just take a quick look here at what I call the tree of fear. And I wonder if you see it. That if you are an aggressive dominant type of person by nature, then the way that fear is likely to manifest itself in your life is to become a bully. 
And if you are a passive, submissive person by nature, then the way that fear will manifest itself will be as, as likely to be as a victim of bullying. And if you're somewhere in between those extremes, then the way that fear is going to manifest itself is in these witnesses who don't give a crap. And all of them come from the same root. And you might ask yourself, where does appalled guy then fit into this picture? Well, he comes in with a chainsaw to cut the whole thing down because that tree is rotten. Completely rotten. But it's more than fear, isn't it? Because in my experience, when I have witnessed cruel, senseless behavior, I don't have time to think logically enough to fear. I react. I'm appalled. I react. Act now, regret later. So what does it take to witness cruel, senseless behavior and to remain unmoved by it? Why the apathy? Your problem isn't my problem. And in fact, if I get a laugh out of your problem, all the better. It's disgusting. Apathy is perhaps indifference to others. Apathy, no passion for others. And it is perhaps the worst and most common crime. It has enabled everything from bullying to slavery to the Holocaust of Jews to the Holocaust of animals. Apathy makes a partner in crime. So see what happens to a crowd of observers when one steps out and objects. And what happens one day if everybody has a healthy reaction to witnessing cruel, senseless behavior? The bully's not getting anywhere near that guy. I call this the army of the appalled. Everybody has a role to play in ending bullying. The bully can end it by not bullying. <laughs> so stop it. You can do better. The victim can end it. If you can't, you can't always take control of your circumstances. You can to some extent and do whatever it takes, be ruthless. But if you can't, you can take control of your ability to be independently well to be untouched by what you are doing, to take no message from what you are doing, just to see it for what it is. Your fear, your insecurities being used as a weapon against me. If you don't know it, you are good, you are precious, you deserve dignity, you deserve love, you deserve nurturing. And anybody who tells you otherwise lies. And the witness can stop it. No matter who you are, even the dumbest idea is enough to put an end to cruel, senseless behavior. But in, intervene, react to what you see and hear. So my conclusion is screw fear, screw apathy, be appalled, butt in, love yourself, love others, live confidently, act intelligently, be happy, be independently well, and finally, be good. Because frankly, the alternative stinks.